Khalid and the tall boy glared at each other. Slowly, they began to move in a circle, the gaze of each fixed intently upon the other, each looking for an opening for his attack, and each wary of the tricks that the other might use. There was no hostility in their eyes, just a keen rivalry and an unshakable determination to win. And Khalid found it necessary to be cautious, for the tall boy was left-handed and thus enjoyed the advantage that all left-handers have over their opponents in a fight. Khalid threw the tall boy, but this was no ordinary fall. As the tall boy fell, there was a distinct crack, and a moment later, the grotesquely twisted shape of his leg showed that the bone had broken. The stricken boy lay motionless on the ground, and Khalid stared in horror at the broken leg of his friend and nephew, the other boy's mother being Khalid's cousin. In course of time, the injury healed, and the leg of the tall boy became whole and strong again. He would wrestle again and be among the best of wrestlers, and the two boys would remain friends. But while they were both intelligent, strong and forceful by nature, neither had patience or tact. They were to continue to compete with each other in almost everything that they did. Make a mental note of this tall boy, for he was to play an important role in the life of Khalid. He was the son of Al-Khattab, and his name was Umar. This was a childhood incident of Khalid bin Walid as narrated in his biography written by Lieutenant General Agha Ibrahim Akram. It's a 300-page detailed biography and I'd recommend anyone interested in Khalid bin Walid or Islamic history in general to give it a read. I got one bodyguard. That's God. Oh, he's my bodyguard. He's your bodyguard. I'm a Muslim. I believe in the religion of Islam. The Quran is the word of God. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, and welcome to Elevating the Ummah. I'm Mahmoud Ahmad, and this episode is on Khalid bin Walid. May Allah be pleased with him. The sword of Allah, the companion of the noble prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, the undefeated military commander and conqueror of vast lands. Khalid bin Walid عن, has continued to serve as an inspiration since the onset of Islam and even now many Muslims look up to his example as the ultimate warrior and military leader. From Khalid bin Walid we we'll learn many lessons, particularly how to be the unparalleled champion in one's chosen field. This is the first episode of the life of the Sword of Allah. Khalid bin Walid was born in Mecca within the influential Bani Makhzum of the Quraysh in the year 31 or 32 before Hijra, or 592 Common Era. His father Walid bin Mughira was a chief of his clan and was supposedly able to name all of his ancestors all the way up to the Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, according to Sayyid Bukhari. Walid had a total of five sons, including Khalid, and two daughters from his various wives. In accordance with the customs at the time in Arabia, Khalid was sent to the countryside to be raised by a wet nurse for the first few years of his life. This custom brought many benefits, since the countryside had clean, unpolluted air and water sources, and the language in use was extremely clear and eloquent, which the children would learn. At the age of five or six, he moved back to Mecca to live with his parents. Now, there were three major clans of the Quraysh in Mecca, the Bani Hashim, which was a clan of the noble prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, the Bani Abdul Dar, and the Bani Makhzum. Bani Makhzum was responsible for matters of war, and so Khalid's childhood and teen years were spent in mastering the arts of war and combat. He became quite capable at horse riding and camel riding, and was an expert with a spear, bow and arrow, sword and the lance. His natural talent lied in the lance, which was used whilst charging on horseback. Khalid grew into a six-foot, well-built, robust man with the knowledge and skills of a warrior. His father was a wealthy man, so Khalid didn't have to occupy himself with earning for a living. Rather, he sharpened his riding and combat skills and also spent his time wrestling. He had the chance to join some of his father's trade caravans to Syria, which was a province of Rome at the time, where he met all kinds of people from various backgrounds. He had a good number of friends, such as Umar ibn al-Khattab, Amr ibn al-As, and even Abu al soon to be known as Abu Jahl. 
His father was his personal military instructor and taught him many battle tactics, specifically for tribal warfare. At this point in his life, Khalid became obsessed with battle. It was his sole ambition to go into battle and claim victory. Even before his first battle, he had promised himself that he would definitely go into battle and attain victory. A true example of belief comes before action. Just around the time when Khalid was 24 years old, some curious rumours began spreading. A new faith was being preached by a 40-year-old man from the Banu Hashim. His name was Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And the message he brought was Islam. Unfortunately though, Al-Walid, Khalid's father, was to be one of the staunchest opponents of Islam and the Prophet, peace be upon him. And so, he'd recount in his home, to all of his children, Khalid included, all of the various efforts that the Quraysh were employing in order to stop this new faith from spreading, and of course the failings. But only three months after the Prophet's migration to Medina, Al-Walid was on his deathbed. He charged his sons with three tasks, some blood feuds and loans which needed to be sorted out, and died. At this point, Khalid had two sons already, Suleiman and Abdurrahman, who actually would go on to become a commander in Syria. Due to Suleiman being the eldest, Khalid became generally known as Abu Suleiman, as well as Khalid and Ibn al-Walid. In the year 2 Hijri, or 624 Common Era, an army of 1,000 Meccan disbelievers were defeated at the hands of an ill-equipped, weaker Muslim army of only 313 companions at the Battle of Badr. Although Khalid wasn't part of this battle, due to not being present at the time in the region of Hijaz, where Makkah and Medina are located, but many of the casualties were from his clan. 17 out of the 70 casualties were his clansmen. Most of these were either cousins or nephews of Khalid. In fact, his brother Walid, named after their father, had actually been taken prisoner by the Muslims. So Khalid and his other brother Hisham went to Medina in order to negotiate Walid's ransom. It was set at 4,000 dirhams, which Hisham tried to lower, but Khalid rebuked him and paid the full amount promptly. However, on their way back to Makkah, when they camped at a place called Dhul Khalifa for the night, Walid secretly returned to Medina and reported to the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, becoming a devout Muslim. This didn't, however, sour his relationship with his brother Khalid, despite of the fact that a new storm was brewing. Only a year after the Battle of Badr, in the year 3 Hijri or 625 Common Era, a new army was prepared by the Meccans and the surrounding tribes which marched on Medina. This time, Khalid was present and did join the expedition. The Prophet's uncle Abbas, who lived in Mecca, had secretly informed him of this army's arrival. The army camped a few miles out of Medina, near the mountain of Uhud, and their numbers were staggering. 3,000 men, 700 of whom were armoured, 3,000 camels and 200 horses, amongst the rest of the retinue, like women and singers. The Muslim army was much smaller, 1,000 men, a hundred of whom were armoured, and only two horses. On the 21st of March, the Prophet wasallam, left Medina at the head of this small army. At this important juncture, the hypocrites who were in the Muslim army, numbering about 300, got cold feet and left to return to Medina, dwindling the Muslim army to a mere 700 men. The next morning, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, deployed his army at the foot of Mount Uhud, with the mountain being behind them and Medina and the enemy army in front of them, and joined the left flank himself. There was a small hill on the side called Ainain, where from the Quraysh could flank the Muslims from behind. So the Prophet وسلم, stationed 50 archers under the command of Abdullah bin Jubair radiallahu an, to stand guard there. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, instructed them to not move an inch from there and keep the enemies in check using their bows and arrows, even if the Muslims were winning or losing. That's how strategically important that hill was. The Meccan army was led by Abu Sufyan, the chieftain, who appointed Ikrima, son of Abu Jahl, to lead the left flank and Khalid to lead the right flank. 
And so, on the 7th of Shawwal 3 Hijri, or 22nd of March 625 Common Era, the Battle of Uhud commenced. After individual challenges where the Muslims were victorious, mostly at the hands of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, general fighting began. Under the cover of a volley of Meccan arrows, Khalid attempted to push forward but was repelled by the Muslim archers. Later, Khalid attempted this again but was repelled once more. During this battle, Washi, the Abyssinian slave of the Meccans, stealthily threw his javelin at Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, which went through his abdomen. The Lion of Allah, Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him, fell in battle. But the Muslim army pushed through and caused the Meccans to retreat. Whilst the Muslims pursued them and began claiming their spoils of war at the Meccan camp, Khalid bin Walid, who didn't allow his men to retreat, waited patiently for the right moment. That moment came when the 50 archers stationed at Ainain thought that since the battle was won, they should be able to join their brethren in claiming spoils. Abdullah bin Jubair, the leader of the archers, stood firm and tried to convince his men not to abandon their posts. But only nine remained with him, whilst the rest abandoned them. This left an opening which Khalid immediately seized upon. He took his men and attacked the remaining archers on the hill. Ikrima saw this and joined in with his men. They flanked the oblivious Muslims from behind, causing much bloodshed and loss of life. The main army of the Quraysh saw this and joined in by attacking the Muslims from the front. Whilst the main armies were engaged, the Prophet ﷺ and 30 of his companions were attacked by Ikrima and his cavalry. The companions bravely defended the Prophet ﷺ and many lost their lives, or were at least injured. The situation became so dire that the Prophet's face was injured when three Meccans got close enough to throw rocks at him. At one point, the Meccans thought that they had killed the Prophet ﷺ. But Khalid saw the Prophet's entourage moving about in the mountain and figured that he was alive. He attempted to reach them but was repelled by Umar ibn al-Khattab and some other companions. The battle was over. The Muslims who initially won had suffered heavily at the hands of the Quraysh. The Meccans felt that they had returned the favour since their loss at Badr. Khalid bin Walid had killed three Muslims. This was his first ever battle and he showed military genius and patience straight away. He was able to keep his men disciplined and got them to obey his orders not to retreat when the Quraysh were on the back foot, showing that he had a good command of men. He had shown much promise of future military achievements. The Battle of Uhud had made a deep impression about the Muslims in Khalid's mind and heart. He couldn't understand how such a small number of people who were so ill-equipped showed such resolve and stood their ground against the odds. The loyalty they had shown to the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and the new faith was astounding. He couldn't wait to meet them again in battle, for they were worthy opponents. At the end of the Battle of Uhud, Abu Sufyan had announced that they would be back at Badr next year to fight the Muslims again. The Muslims, led by the Prophet sallallahu and numbering 1,500 men, arrived at Badr at the appointed time. But the Quraysh wasn't there. Eventually, Abu Sufyan gathered 2,000 men, including Khalid bin Walid, but decided to turn back, giving the excuse that this year was particularly hot and there was not enough rain, so they'd return in better conditions. The next battle was the Battle of Ahzab, or the Confederates, where various Arab tribes, led by the Quraysh, mustered a force of 10,000 men and marched on Medina. This was in 6 Hijri, or 627 Common Era. The Muslims, numbering 3,000, amongst whom hundreds were hypocrites, not to be relied on, were advised by Salman the Persian, a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to dig a ditch which would be too wide and deep to cross for the enemy, as was the Persian custom against a superior force. This proposal was accepted and the ditch was dug. This resulted in a 23-day siege by the Confederates. Both sides were greatly tested by hunger and by the extreme cold of that particular winter and also of not being able to swiftly end the matter by their usual intense combat. This was a game of strategy and patience. At one point, Ikrima was able to jump over the ditch on horseback with six other people. But after two of his men were killed, they escaped back over to their side. The next day, Khalid wished to jump over from the same place with his cavalry but the Muslims had fortified that area already. Despite this, Khalid acted like he was retreating, but suddenly galloped over with his cavalry. A small battle ensued in which two Muslims were killed, but the odds were stacked against Khalid, and so he retreated with his men. 
this being the last major military action of the battle. Only two days later, a storm raged through the Confederate camp, knocking over tents and pots, putting out flames. The Confederates could no longer take it and decided to return home. In total, only four people had been killed on both sides, but the Muslims managed to defend Medina from the invaders. The Confederates returned home, unsuccessful in their siege. In six Hijri, or 628 common era, the Prophet, peace be upon him, set out with 1,500 fully armoured Muslims for Makkah. His intention was to go and perform Umrah, the lesser pilgrimage. The Quraysh feared that the Muslims were marching to attack and sent Khalid with a contingent of 300 men to try to stall them. This he attempted, but the Muslims outmaneuvered him, and so he returned to Makkah. In any case, the Muslims signed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah with the Meccans that year, and when they returned the next year in 7 Hijri, or 629 common era, the Prophet, peace be upon him, performed the pilgrimage to Mecca along with his companions. Ever since this pilgrimage, Khalid bin Walid began to have serious doubts about his ancestral religion of idol worship. It had never appealed to him much, and he had always kept an open mind. And now, without sharing his thoughts with anyone, he pondered deeply about religious matters. Suddenly, he came to the realization that Islam was the truth. <laughs> it's reported that Khalid spoke to Ikrimah of this realization, but Ikrimah couldn't believe how Khalid could accept Islam since Muslims had killed so many of his dear ones in their battles. To this, Khalid replied, that is a matter of ignorance, which is to say, those dear ones were killed in a state of jahiliyyah or ignorance from Islam. When Abu Sufyan heard about this, he was raging at Khalid. But Ikrimah, to his credit, who was Khalid's childhood friend, convinced Abu Sufyan to restrain himself, since Khalid had every right to choose whichever religion he wanted to. On that night, Khalid gathered his weapons and armour and set off for Medina. On the way, he met two others, Amr ibn Las and Uthman bin Talha, both former enemies of Islam who were on their way to Medina for the same purpose, astonishingly. They arrived in Medina on the 1st of Safar 8 Hijri, or 31st of May, 629 common era, and went to the house of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Khalid entered first and made his submission. He was now a Muslim, with a clean slate. This happened when he was 43 years old. He was happy to be in Medina, and he was welcomed by all of his friends, very warmly even by his old wrestling rival, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Khalid would often find himself sitting in the mosque, listening to the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, talking for hours, or even at the Prophet's house. Once, he was at his house when a companion sent some food over for the Prophet. It was roast lizard, which the Prophet himself did not eat, but Khalid heartily enjoyed. Only three months after accepting Islam, Khalid was sent as part of a 3,000-member strong army for retribution for a Muslim envoy who was killed by the Ghassan tribe. The Prophet appointed Zain bin Haritha as a commander, and if he were to fall, then Jafir bin Abi Talib, and if he were to fall, then Abdullah bin Ruwaha, and if he fell, then the Muslims could decide upon a leader between them. The army marched towards Syria when they heard reports that Heraclius, the Eastern Roman Emperor, had amassed an army of 100,000 men, supposedly. And if the reports are to be believed, another 100,000 Christian Arabs joined them. But a more sensible estimate would probably put them between at least 10 to 15,000 men. Still a staggering number. The Muslim army held counsel as to what to do given the odds, but decided to march on and fight with high spirits. So the two armies met at a place called Mutta. This is where the battle derived its name, the Battle of Mutta, which is in modern day Jordan. The battle commenced in the third week of Jamad al 8 Hijri. The fighting was intense, especially in the middle where Khalid was situated. One after the other, the brave Muslim commanders who held the standard fell. First, Zayd fell, then Jafar, and then Abdullah ibn Rawaha. May Allah be pleased with them all. After all three had been martyred, another companion, Thabit bin Arqam, picked up the standard and asked the Muslims to choose a commander. He eyed Khalid and offered him command. 
Khalid politely declined due to being a new convert and said that he, as in Thabit, was more deserving since he was an old convert. Khalid said, you are more deserving than I. To this, Thabit replied, not I and none but you. The Muslims agreed and acknowledged Khalid's military capabilities and so he assumed command. The situation was dire. The Muslims were outnumbered and in a state of confusion. After all, three of their commanders had fallen. Despite the odds, Khalid calculated that the best course of action would be a frontal assault on the enemy to daze them, which would give the Muslims time to regroup and recollect themselves. In this attack, Qutba, who commanded the Muslim right wing, managed to kill the Christian commander Malik in a duel. The enemy was stunned at this setback and pulled back to reorganize. Khalid did the same with his army. They pulled back and reorganized themselves. Despite suffering heavy losses, the Muslims were not defeated. Khalid alone had broken nine swords on his Christian enemies. But the situation was at a stalemate, so Khalid decided to retreat and marched back to Medina with the army. At first, the inhabitants of Medina thought that Khalid had fled defeated and disgraced from the battle scene, and so he wasn't too popular for a while. But the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, saw the wisdom in the retreat, in that it was not exactly a defeat, just a means to fight another day. And as far as Khalid ibn Walid's record was concerned, it was untarnished because he wasn't appointed commander from the very onset of the battle. So in a way, it wasn't his battle. He merely took command towards the end of the battle and was able to save countless lives by safely returning the troops home. And most crucially, it was at this moment when Khalid returned from the Battle of Mutta that the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, They have not fled. They shall return to fight if Allah wills it. Khalid is the sword of Allah. From this day on, he became known as Saifullah, the sword of Allah. In a way, it was a guarantee for success in future battles. On the 20th of the blessed month of Ramadan, 8 Hijri, corresponding to the 11th of January, 630 Common Era, after a tribe aligned with the Quraysh broke the truce of Hudaybiyah by attacking a tribe aligned with the Muslims, the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, marched on Mecca with 10,000 Muslim soldiers. The army was split into four columns. Each was to enter Mecca from one of the four valleys leading into it. These four columns were commanded by Abu Ubaidah, Zubair, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Khalid bin Walid. May Allah be pleased with them all. Khalid was given the northeast route into Mecca via Layt and Khandama. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, had ordered this to be a bloodless conquest. The Meccans were told that if they stayed in their homes with their doors locked, or in the mosque area of the Kaaba, or in Abu Sufyan's home since he had sought the Prophet's amnesty, they would not be harmed. But although this was the Prophet's wish, they did expect some potential resistance. Three of the four columns entered Mecca without any resistance at all. But as Khalid was entering with his men, Ikrima and Safwan, his childhood friends, attacked his column with a volley of arrows and swords. Khalid was swift in reacting, and his men were able to kill 12 Meccan soldiers, whilst only two Muslims were martyred. The Prophet ﷺ was initially unhappy when he heard that there was a little bloodshed. But when Khalid explained to him that it was in self-defense, the Prophet accepted his justification. The Prophet, peace be upon him, went on to destroy all the idols of the Kaaba, and most Meccans accepted Islam on that day. This day became known as Fatah Makkah the conquest of Makkah. After the conquest, the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent out small expeditions to neighboring settlements to destroy the idols in the local temples. Khalid was sent to Nakhla to destroy Uzza, the most important of the goddesses. And so he set out with 30 horsemen. At first, he found the idol and reported back to the Prophet, peace be upon him, after destroying it. But the Prophet sensed that this idol was a fake and asked Khalid if he had seen anything unusual, to which Khalid said no. So the Prophet told him that he had destroyed a fake. Khalid, furious at his own mistake, rode out to Nakhla once again and located the actual temple with the real statue. The custodian of the temple had already fled but left a sword dangling on the statue's neck, hoping it might defend itself. There was also a dark-skinned lady standing in his way, who was naked and wailed loudly. 
Khalid drew his sword and cut her clean in two and smashed the idol. When he reported this all to the Prophet, he said that yes, now the real idol had been destroyed. On the 20th of January 630 Common Era, the Prophet وسلم, sent expeditions to neighboring towns in order to call them to Islam, ordering his commanders to avoid bloodshed if possible. Khalid was sent to the area of Tihama and so he set out with 350 men. The objective was the town of Yalamlam, 50 miles from Makkah. Only 15 miles out, they came across the tribe of Bani Jazima, who in the days of ignorance had a blood feud with Khalid's tribe since they killed his uncle. Although they had accepted Islam, they had their weapons at hand, ready for battle. When Khalid tried to convince them to lay down their weapons if they had truly accepted Islam, because then no harm would come to them, they shot back saying that if they did that, he would tie their hands and chop their heads off. At some point, they laid down their arms. But Khalid, for one reason or the other, bound their hands and ordered his men to execute them. Only one group of his men followed through. The rest, including Abdullah ibn Umar and Abu Qatada, may Allah be pleased with them both, refused. When the Prophet, peace be upon him, found out about this, he sent Ali radiallahu an, on a diplomatic mission with a lot of gold in order to pay the tribe their blood feud. He was successful in his mission. And so when the Prophet, peace be upon him, summoned Khalid to explain himself, Khalid said that he did not think that they had accepted Islam truthfully and sincerely. When Abdurrahman bin Awf, an, whose father Awf was also killed by the Bani Jazima, along with Khalid's uncle, got into a heated argument with Khalid, the Prophet, peace be upon him, on account of Abdurrahman bin Awf an, being an early companion and one of the Ashra Mubashra, who were the ten companions, promised paradise whilst they were still alive rebuked Khalid by saying, Leave my companions alone, O Khalid. If you possessed a mountain of gold and spent it in the way of Allah, you would not achieve the status of my companions. By companions, he of course referred to his early companions, since Khalid himself was a companion as well. But he had only accepted Islam just a few months ago. And so this was an important lesson for Khalid, a reminder of his status and standing as compared to earlier companions. It was a humbling lesson for him, which he'd keep in mind on many future occasions. Hardly had the Meccans pledged allegiance to the Prophet, peace be upon him, that a new threat emerged. Two tribes, the Hawazin from the region to the northeast of Mecca and the Thaqif from the area of Taif, had formed a coalition, along with several other smaller tribes, of 12,000 men with the intention to eradicate the threat of the spread of Islam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, although not inclined towards bloodshed, understood that the psychological effect on the Arabs of the conquest of Mecca would come under jeopardy if the Muslims ran away from this challenge, or worse yet, lost. So he took his 10,000 men with whom he had marched onto Mecca, and an additional 2,000 men from the Quraysh who had just recently converted, but whose loyalty and allegiance was naturally questionable. This included Abu Sufyan and Safwan bin Umayyah, the Muslims set out on the 6th of Shawwal, 8 Hijri, or 27th January, 630 Common Era. The vanguard consisted of 700 men from Banu Sulaym, led by Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an. Only four days after setting off, the Muslims reached the valley of Hunayn and established their camp. It was this valley that the battle would be known by. Now, the valley of Hunayn was an extremely narrow one. The Muslims, having camped the night, awoke the next morning and marched into the valley in order to go to the camp of the enemy, where they expected to fight the battle. But the enemy leader, a man named Malik bin Auf, a 30-year-old fiery man, had a trick up his sleeve. He had marched his men, under the cover of night, into and around the valley of Hunayn, where they were ready with their bows and arrows to ambush the Muslims. When Khalid's vanguard came into sight, the enemy unleashed a volley of arrows. Hundreds of arrows began raining upon the Muslims. This ambush caught them unawares and panic began to spread. People began running here and there, trying to cover themselves from the arrows. Khalid tried to control his men and shouted orders, but they were drowned out by the shouting and panicking caused by the confusion. The Banu Sulaim began retreating and a scene of utter confusion occurred when they started pushing the main army of the Muslims back. This confusion caused the 2,000 Meccans and even some Muslims to retreat and disperse, even whilst the Prophet, peace be upon him, tried to calm them down. At one point, only nine people had remained around the Prophet, peace be upon him, such as Ali, Umar, 
Abu Bakr and Abbas, may Allah be pleased with them all. Khalid himself had been injured in the ambush and after falling off of his horse, he was unable to move due to his wounds for a while. Eventually, the Prophet, peace be upon him, got the Muslims under control and they pushed the enemy back with a fierce counter-offensive. By this time, Khalid was able to get back up and the Muslims managed to turn the tide. The enemy was pushed out of the valley all the way to their camp at a place called Autas, where they would commit to a last stand, but they were defeated in part due to the cavalry led by Khalid. Due to the lack of skill of the enemy archers, the Muslims had only suffered four martyrdoms in the ambush, whilst the enemy suffered 70 casualties. This was only the second time in history that an entire army had ambushed another entire army, the first being Hannibal Barca's ambush of the Romans at the Battle of Lake Trasimene in the year 217 before Common Era. Over the next few days, the Prophet, peace be upon him, led his army to Taif, where Malik had safely retreated to with his army behind the city walls. Khalid was again in charge of the vanguard, with Banu Sulaym as his cavalry. On the 15th of Shawal, 8 Hijri, the siege was laid, which would last for 18 days. But after a hopeless stalemate, on the 4th of Dhul Qadha, 8 Hijri, or 23rd February, 630 Common Era, the Prophet, peace be upon him, in accordance with the advice of Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhuma, lifted the siege and returned to Makkah to attend to more pressing matters. But not soon after, the Hawazin returned to the Prophet, peace be upon him, claiming that they had accepted Islam. They requested that their women and children be returned to them, and the Prophet, out of his kindness and mercy, returned them. Only a few days after the siege, even Malik bin Auf, the brilliant military commander of the enemy tribes, slipped out of Taif and came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, to accept Islam. This was at the end of the year of 8 Hijri, and in the next year, many Arab tribes would send delegations to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in order to formally accept Islam on behalf of their tribes. <laughs> فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا In the ninth year of Hijrah, the Prophet, peace be upon him, received reports that the Roman Emperor Heraclius, known as Hiraqal in Islamic tradition, was deploying a vast number of troops near the borders of Jordan and Arabia. So, in Rajab of that year, corresponding to October 630 Common Era, the largest Muslim army ever to assemble at that point in time, set out from Medina. Some figures estimate that the army was 30,000 strong. However, upon arriving at the Buk, they came to know that the Romans had already retreated to Damascus. And so, the Prophet, peace be upon him, decided to expand his political borders by signing pacts with the surrounding tribes of the area. Khalid bin Walid was sent at the head of 400 men in order to subdue Dawmatul Jandal, which was ruled by Uqaidr bin Abdul Malik, a Christian prince from the tribe of Kinda. Khalid arrived at the small walled town at night and saw that the prince was just leaving the town on horseback with a few men for a hunt. Khalid took this opportunity and jumped the group, taking down Uqaidr himself and bringing him to the Prophet, peace be upon him, alive. Uqaidr accepted the terms of surrender and signed a treaty with the Muslims. After this, the Muslim army returned to Medina by the middle of December in the year 630 Common Era. The next year, in Rabiul Akhir, 10 Hijri, or July 631 Common Era, the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent Khalid at the head of 400 mountain warriors to the tribe of Bani Haritha bin Kab in Najran. He instructed Khalid to call the tribe to Islam thrice. If they responded favorably, then no harm should come to them. But if they refused, then they should fight them. When Khalid arrived in Najran, he gave the call to Islam and the tribe accepted it. There was no bloodshed whatsoever. Khalid decided to stay with them for the next few months in order to teach them the new religion. And after being satisfied with their progress, wrote to the Prophet, peace be upon him, to give him a report. The Prophet, peace be upon him, sent Khalid an appreciative letter in response and asked him to return to Medina along with some men from the tribe in order to sign their treaty. And so in Shawal 10 Hijri, or January 632 Common Era, Khalid returned to Medina. This was his last mission in the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him.
And I think this is a good place to end this episode. We've covered Khalid bin Walid's early life, period of ignorance or pre-Islam, acceptance of Islam and life as a Muslim during the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. There's a lot more to cover, so in the future we'll cover his life during the reigns of the first two caliphs of Islam, Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, and also we'll be covering the part of Khalid's life where he truly shines as the sword of Allah, bringing entire empires to their knees. But before I end, here are some lessons from the life of Khalid bin Walid so far. Firstly, there is no shadow of doubt that Khalid bin Walid was trained to be a warrior and military tactician from day one. His entire upbringing was focused on that. Additionally, he actually enjoyed this military upbringing and longed to be a great warrior. These two factors, namely vigorously training a set of skills for a certain path in life and enjoying that certain choice, is the recipe for success. Before Tiger Woods spent most of his day with a golf club in his hand since the age of three, or Mozart spent thousands of hours practicing to become one of the greatest musicians according to the West, it was Khalid bin Walid radiallahu an who showed the world that if you start early enough at what you truly enjoy, you can master that art. Secondly, his ability to remain level-headed at a time of what seemed nothing short of defeat at the Battle of Mota. Three commanders had died, and the command of a losing battle was given to Khalid. But rather than running away from that responsibility, he stepped up and salvaged the situation. He didn't try to chase glory by charging the enemy army directly in a final assault which might have caused countless deaths of many revered companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. No, he chose to protect those lives and retreat to Medina, even though he might have known that the people back home would see it as an act of cowardice, though it wasn't. But what we can safely deduce from the Prophet's reaction was that Khalid's intention was good and he valued the lives of his men over instant glory. And this is what earned him the title Saifullah, Sword of Allah, an honour by which he is known to this day. So the lesson here is that sometimes it's best not to choose the route of instant gratification or glory. Choose the more virtuous path, though it may not look as glorious. You might just end up being rewarded exponentially for that delayed gratification, as long as your intentions are good. Well, I'm sure there are many more lessons to learn from this great life, but I'll leave it at that for this episode. As always, remember the purpose of this podcast, we need to elevate the Ummah to greater standards. The best way forward is to elevate ourselves spiritually, mentally and physically, and work towards a brighter future. We must learn to set aside our differences and find strength in unity. I kindly request you to rate this podcast and share it with your friends and family. It really helps the algorithm push my podcast to more like-minded listeners such as yourselves. And if you're on X, formerly known as Twitter, follow me. My handle is Decolonized Muslim. And as you can guess from the name, my aim is to educate fellow Muslims about the great heritage and contributions of the Islamic world, as well as Islam's superior teachings in comparison to all other ideologies and isms. Of course, it's also the best place to keep up to date with news and updates about my podcast, such as new episodes. And you can send me a message if you want to get in touch. Stay tuned for more inspirational stories in the future, inshallah. With peace, assalamu alaikum.